coming down the telescope instead of just just the uh, what we call the amplitude of the power. So the electromagnetic waves like light have what we call amplitude and phase information. And optically, when you when you detect it, you put a photographic plate or a CCD or something. You're just detecting the power that comes in. You're losing the phase information. So you can't combine the signals from different optical telescopes very easily. Radio wave telescopes can be done. You can do that with radio telescopes very easily. And you can do it across the Earth. So here's a schematic of the Earth with 10 radio telescopes. I wish they were that big, but they aren't. Uh, from Hawaii to the Virgin Islands to New England up in New Hampshire. This is called the Very Long Baseline Array. And basically you we used to tape record the signals that came in each telescope, time tagged them with an atomic clock, brought the tapes back to a central location, played them back, aligned them very carefully in time, and you could essentially reconstruct what your eye would see if your eye were as big as the Earth, and if your eye could see radio waves. So you basically have little pieces of a giant telescope uh, with, with this technique. So you can get very high angular resolution. So if you observe, for example, at a one centimeter wavelength, which is what I gave you earlier, uh, with 8,000 kilometer baselines, you can synthesize, you get a beam or a response of about a milli arc second with this telescope. Okay, I don't know if I want to. Let me run a few numbers by you, just to show you. So I mentioned the fringe spacing. Uh, or the resolution of the telescope of one, at one centimeter wavelength, 8,000 kilometer telescope gives you, it's about a quarter of a milli arc second here, 250 micro arc seconds. Um, if you want to measure just where the center of an object is, you centroid on it basically, uh, that you, roughly the accuracy is the resolution of the telescope divided by the signal to noise you have. That's fairly simple. And so even with modest signal to noise of say 12 to 1 or so, you can take your resolution of 250 micro arc seconds and say the center of that point-like object I'm looking at, that star, uh, you can measure it to maybe 10 micro arc seconds based on signal to noise. The problem, of course, is that signal to noise is not what limits you when you make these measurements. What limits you are systematic sources of error, which, of course, all astronomers deal with. For example, Hook was worried about refraction, which is a systematic error when you're trying to measure the position of two, two stars at different times of the year. So uh, basically, a simple rule of thumb is that with an interferometer, if you have a delay of your signals, the signal will hit one telescope at a different time than the other because it's going through the Earth's atmosphere. If you have a delay of light, the light crossing time over about a centimeter, which is about a thirtieth of a nanosecond, that will that give you a delay of about one wavelength. A one wavelength delay basically shifts your fringes, and I, I don't think I can explain that here right now, but moves the position of the objects by about a, a, a fringe or about that amount. And so basically the systematics that we have right now limit us to measure, measurements of about 500 micro arc seconds, half a milli arc second in an absolute sense. But what we do to get around this is we look at what Galileo suggested, two stars close together on the sky, and you cancel your systematic effects by their separation. And so you just convert the separation into radians, and typically we find objects within one degree of what we want. One degree converted to radians is 0.02 radians, and so we cancel our systematic errors, we get about 2% of them left over. So 2% of our 500 micro arc second systematic error becomes about 10 micro arc seconds. And this is sort of the accuracy we are getting now. 0 0.01 milli arc seconds. So let me just show you how, what parallax data looks like. Uh, there's sort of three ways to display parallax data. Some astronomers like it one way, some like it the other. I'll just run through them for you. Uh, here's a plot with of the sky basically north is up and east is to the left and if you're if you're on a star looking down at the earth going around the sun you'll see it trace out essentially a circular orbit but you might be observing it face on to the earth's orbit or edge on or something in between so in general what you will see if you're the source is the earth going around the sun in sort of an ellipse <coughs> because of the tilt of the earth's orbit as viewed by the object 
And so basically what we will detect as the Earth goes around the Sun, the parallax effect, will be an elliptical path on the sky with a one-year period. On top of that, however, the stars we're looking at are moving, we're moving. Uh, we don't know all of those mo motions. And so there is a, a differential motion between us and, and any object we're looking at called proper motion by astronomers. And it will be in some direction. It may not be predictable very easily. You have to measure that. So basically what we observe is this ellipse every year, once around, superposed on a drift across the sky, which is the proper motion of the star. And so what we'll see is something like this green curve here, these little curlicues as a function of time. One curlicue every year. And that's what we're trying to measure. Now another way to look at this, uh, I don't like to, to look at this plot very much. I find it's hard to figure out. If you put a data point on this plot, say right there, you don't really know quickly, is, does it belong over here or does it belong down there? So it's hard to assess how, how good it is. So there's two other ways to plot this. One is to plot the angular offset in, say, right ascension or declination as a function of time. So let's look at this red curve here. This is the parallax effect plus the proper motion in the eastwardly direction as a function of time. So here are two years across the bottom. And, uh, and the dashed line would show a possible sinusoidal motion project on top of a bigger proper motion mostly in the declination direction, which I've shown you here. So you can look at these plots, and I think these are easier to look at because you can see exactly where your data points fall relative to the curve. Now, if you've designed your observations very carefully, you can make it so that essentially your measurement of proper motion is independent of your measurement of the parallax. You get a zero correlation, it's called. And so basically, you can remove the proper motion from this data, this slope upward here in the right ascension and slope downward here in declination, and come up with a curve at the right, which is just the Earth's orbital effect, the easiest, the most direct thing, which is essentially the parallax measurement. And so for this object, this hypothetical object, the parallax is essentially just the amplitude of this, this sinusoid, in this case in right ascension. And so that would be a half of a milliarc second parallax, meaning a star at 2,000 parsecs away. Okay, so let me show you some real data. Oh, by the way, for sources in the galaxy, uh, in the Milky Way, the declination signature is always much smaller, or can be much smaller, than the right ascension signature. So quite often, we only try to measure the right ascension peaks here. And we don't bother with the declination peaks because they're smaller. And actually, our systematic errors are worse in declination than right ascension for many objects, not for all. It really depends whether the source we're looking at is a high declination object and therefore overhead in the north or a low declination object. And therefore, we have a lot more atmosphere to look at. And it actually shifts positions in declination more than right ascension. So that's a minor point. But basically, our data often looks like this. So let me show you one nice example. This is a parallax to some very young stars in the Orion Nebula Cluster. So here's a picture of the inner portion of the Orion Cluster, the trapezium. This is the trapezium area here. And it turns out that if you have very young stars, sort of million-year-old stars, they still have an accretion disk around them. There are a lot of magnetic fields. There's some free electrons. They're moving around in the magnetic fields, and they're emitting radio waves. And so they're actually very nice, fairly point-like sources of radio emission, which is good for us to observe. And so we've actually measured the position of four, well, three of these stars. One we can only get for three epochs, but there are four stars here. One up here, one right here, which is associated with Theta 1a Orionis. It's a distant uh, companion of Theta 1a, a low-mass star uh, that emits radio waves. And then there are two others over here. And if you remember, you can see that little parallax plot at the bottom that I showed.